Jesus is the loftiest idea in philosophy. Jesus is the descendant of David. Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah and the Savior of the world. And get this, Jesus is God in the flesh. Today, we continue our series through the book of Mark, a series that we have titled Knowing and Following Jesus. And we find ourselves in chapter 12, verses 35 through 40. And for those of you who are jotting down notes and following along in today's sermon, I have titled today's sermon, More Than a Man. And the theme of the text, the sermon in a sentence that we're going to really focus in on today is that Jesus is Lord and he exposes religious hypocrisy in the final judgment. And so if you leave today understanding nothing else but that, then you're going to leave understanding the, the emphasis of the text, that Jesus is Lord and he exposes religious hypocrisy in the final judgment. And so my hope and my prayer for everyone in the room today that as we come together, as we sing songs, as we hear preaching from the word, that it would not be out of routine, that it would not be out of a desire for attention, but that we would genuinely seek Christ with our worship and with our lives. And so let's take a moment and let's remind ourselves of the context of the book. John Mark penned these words. He penned them as Peter was describing the events of Jesus' life. He did so to encourage struggling Christians who were living in Rome, who were facing severe persecution. Mark spent 10 chapters of the book, 10 whole chapters, describing 33 years of Jesus' life. And honestly, it was one fast-paced story after another immediately is, is a common theme throughout the book of Mark as we go from one event to the next event to the next event. But then in chapter 11, Mark slows down the story as we enter into Passion Week. And in today's text, it is Tuesday of Passion Week. If you remember the, the chronology of the story here, Jesus comes back in on a Sunday. They're waving palm branches. They are shouting, Hosanna. Jesus wakes up the next morning. He goes into the temple and he overthrows the tables because people are taking advantage of the poor and they turn the house of God in nothing more than a business. But then on Tuesday, which is where we find ourselves at today, that's where a day was filled with controversy. Jesus walks into the courts of the temple. His teachings were repeatedly interrupted by authorities, by religious elite who brought about political, theological, and religious questions in hopes of entrapping Jesus in his words. Each failed to discredit Jesus in order to produce a charge against him. I mean, really, his reaction and response to all of these religious leaders throughout chapter 11 and in, in chapter 12, it's remarkable what Jesus does. In the preceding story, we are introduced to a man who comes on the scene who's not trying to entrap Jesus. Just a scribe comes up who hears him arguing and wants to have a conversation with him. And in verse 34, it ends by saying, from then on, no one dared to ask Jesus any more questions. The wording in verse 34 is, is, is extremely strong wording signifying that Jesus had prevailed over those who were against him. But the words that Jesus is about to give is, it's significant. And it's significant for one primary reason, because this will be Jesus's last public appearance until the crucifixion. His last words to the public. Everything else after this will be done in private with his disciples. But Jesus is standing in the temple for the last time, teaching the word. And so if you have found your place in the scriptures, in Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 35, I want to invite you, if you're physically able, to stand with me in honor of and in reverence to the reading of God's inerrant, life-giving word. It says, and as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, 
How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. And in his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feast, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray that as we open up the scriptures, God, as we look into them today, I pray that you would illuminate our eyes and our hearts to see and to receive the word. God, I pray that you would soften hearts in this room. God, I pray that the warning that we read about with religious hypocrisy and the warning of a greater condemnation, God, I pray that it would drive us to the arms of Jesus where there is no condemnation found for those that are in Christ. So God, move through the preaching of your word. Bind me to the truths of your word. And may those truths penetrate our hearts in ways that only you can. God, we love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I want us to see two truths about Jesus. And before you get too excited thinking, well, it's a two-point sermon, not a three-point sermon, we're getting out of here early. I don't think that's going to be the case. I just want to prep you now that the length of the sermon is probably going to be the same, even though the points are two-thirds of what they normally are. But the first truth I want you to note about Jesus. Number one is Jesus is both the son of David and Lord. He is both the son of David and Lord. Let's take a moment and let's look at what Jesus does with our passage, beginning in verse 35. It says, and as Jesus taught in the temple, he said. And so where do we find Jesus? Out of the gate, we find Jesus taught in the temple. He is teaching the word. He is expounding upon the scriptures. He is no longer in the court of the Gentiles and he is no longer being questioned. We now find Jesus doing what he often did, which is opening up the Old Testament and teaching to anybody who would listen to him. Now listen, what I love about this is Jesus has a great crowd that's gathered around him. And there's a, a, a movement today, and I love the movement. And the movement is this. Hey, disciple making takes place with individuals taking two or three people and investing their life in them. And while I believe that's 100% the way disciples should be made, right? Where you come, you gather in corporate worship, you break off into smaller groups throughout the week, or in our case on Sunday nights, and then from that you build relationships of people who will then disciple you or you disciple them into growing in their relationship with Jesus. But what I do not want to do is downplay the significance of the gathering of the church on the Lord's day when the Bible is being preached and taught. Some have said that Jesus didn't make disciples by teaching the crowds. He absolutely taught and preach the Bible to anyone who would listen. The Bible was, and I want you to note this, the Bible was, is, and always will be central to disciple making. So from the pulpit to the homes in our small groups that we have, to groups that are gonna meet outside of those homes and coffee shops and at lunch tables and wherever it is you're gonna do discipleship on the golf course, I don't know. The Bible has to be central to our disciple-making strategy. And in these two verses, Jesus does not just ask any question. Jesus asked the most important question of all because his question was about the identity of the Messiah, the Christ, the one who would be the Savior of the world. One commentary writer noted this. He said, I, think, or I don't think it would be a stretch to say it is the question of the ages. What Jesus had been teaching the disciples privately, he is now taking publicly. And so what is the question then? He asked the question in verse 35, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? Jesus is taking a popular belief that the Christ was going to be the son of David and now he's going to teach them about who the Messiah truly is. Jesus is not denying here that the Messiah is gonna be the son of David. 
But what he is about to teach them is that the Messiah is not merely the son of David. And what he does in verse 36 then is he cites Psalm 110, which was the most quoted passage in the Old Testament of his day. And he invited his audience, the temple audience, to reconsider whether the son of David is adequate enough to explain who the Messiah is. And along the way, I want you to note this as well. Jesus also taught and he affirmed the divine inspiration of the scriptures. Let's go back and look at verse 36 together. It said, David himself in the Holy Spirit declared. But we're going to stop there for a moment. Because Jesus here is not just casually saying that David and the Holy Spirit said this. What Jesus is doing here is he is affirming the divine inspiration of the Bible. Jesus does two things in verse 36. First, he attributes Psalm 110 to David, which all the Jews at this point in time knew that David wrote Psalm 110. But the second thing Jesus does, he notes that David was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write Psalm 110. Here we find an incredible description of what the Bible is. Are you ready for this? The Bible was written by men who were moved and empowered by the work of the Holy Spirit. It is both a human book and a divine book at the same time. You don't know why you can read the Bible today that was written thousands of years ago and you think to yourself, well, it's almost as if it's as relevant as this morning's paper. You know why? Because it's a divine book. And it's living and it's breathing. That's the reason why. And Jesus, by the way, is affirming this. Any liberal scholar is like, well, listen, the the Bible is not divinely inspired. Jesus didn't teach that. They didn't read it. They didn't read it. And any modern preacher that says, well, the Old Testament is really irrelevant. We need to focus on the love of Jesus in the New Testament. They didn't read the words of Jesus either. Because the Old Testament is rich with theology. And the Old Testament preaches Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. Paul writes to young Timothy, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And how from childhood, I love this, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. What are we doing in Kids Point right now? What's going on in nursery right now? What takes place on Wednesday nights when youth gather and we're doing Bible drills on Wednesday nights? What are we doing? We're acquainting children with the teachings of the Bible in hopes that they will see that through Christ and through faith in Christ comes salvation. And Paul goes on. He didn't stop there. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God. It's God breathed and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. If you want to be equipped to serve Jesus, immerse yourself in the scriptures. Be a person who lives in the book. You see, the Bible is not just a human book, but a book that is divinely inspired by the God of the universe. Saints, listen to me. Divine revelation is at our fingertips. And we must be committed to hearing from God through the scriptures. Because with this one line, Jesus affirms the inspiration of the Old Testament. And Jesus highlights the divine inspiration of the scriptures to demonstrate to his hearers, listen to me, that the Messiah would always be more than the son of David. The Jews at the time believed that the Messiah was going to be the son of David. And Jesus is about to expand that in just a moment. And so Jesus is letting his listeners know that the point he is about to make bears the weight, listen to me, of divine revelation. The point he's about to make, he's not just making something up random. Jesus is taking the Bible, what they believe, and he is showing them that the Messiah was gonna be more than a mere man. You see, God had promised to send the Messiah to redeem and restore his people. 2 Samuel chapter seven, verses 11 through 16 is where the Lord promised David that one would sit on his throne forever. How can a mere man sit on the throne forever? The answer is he can't. And so what God's people needed was more than a mere man. They needed the God-man. In verse 35, Jesus questioned what the scribes taught about the Christ in light of the scriptures. The religious leaders here quoted the word all the time, and Jesus is strategic with his question. And I want you to note this, Jesus confirms then the humanity of the Messiah. He confirms it. 
He confirms the humanity of the Messiah. How can the scribe say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And so just imagine for a moment, all of Israel's gathered. They are looking and longing for the Messiah. They're longing for the one who would come through David's line who would be a man. And Jesus here affirms that the Messiah will be a human descendant of David. Everybody agreed with that. In Mark chapter 10, even blind Bartimaeus, if you remember that story, which was months ago at this point in time when I preached it, but in Mark chapter 10, blind Bartimaeus cried out, Jesus, son of David, that's a messianic title, have mercy on me, because he knew that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. Even in the triumphal entry, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David, Hosanna in the highest. And so there's messianic language attached to Jesus. And I want you to note this. The primary issue the religious leaders had with Jesus wasn't his miracles. It really wasn't even the jealousy because of the crowds. Saints, listen to me. They killed Jesus because he claimed to be God. He claimed to be the Messiah. Judaism correctly believed that the Messiah was David's son. That he would come through the lineage of David. But I want you to know that Jesus expands on the nature of the Messiah. Jesus is not denying that the Messiah would come from the line of David. He is noting, however, that the Messiah is both David's son and David's Lord at the same time. And so if we go back and look at what it says as he's quoting from Psalm 110, David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, all right? So that word Lord there is used twice in one statement, but it's actually two different words, all right? The first word, the Lord, is Yahweh, which is the self-existing one, said to my Lord, Adonai, that's the sovereign one. And so the language here is pretty clear. It's, it's two different things. David uses two terms to describe two persons. Both were called Lord. The Jews read this as a messianic psalm. The Lord God said to the Messiah King, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. This is language that is Trinitarian language. It's God the Father talking to God the Son, saying that he's gonna put all things under his feet. And so the Messiah then was not simply David's son or relative. He would be David's king and God as well. David's wording does not work if the Messiah is just a human being. He must be more than a mere man. You see, the Messiah had to be superior to David and not merely a descendant of David, as the Jews popular, popularly believed. Don Carson said of this text, the teacher who never attended the right schools confounds the greatest theologians in the land. And so the question then has to be asked. Are you ready for the question? How was the Messiah both the son of David and the Lord of David at the same time? John gives us that answer in John chapter one, verse 14, when it says, and the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ was the God man. David's son was David's Lord because David's son was going to be David's God. And then verse 37 ends. I want you to notice how verse 37 ends. Verse 37 ends says this, and the great throng heard him gladly. The crowds no doubt enjoyed seeing the religious elite squirming in their seats. They loved seeing these powerful men, these prestigious men squirming and have no response. They were eager hearers. But I want to note this. They were not true converts. The crowd loved what Jesus did to the religious elite, but they didn't think of how it applied to them. Listen, the crowds represent many in the church who will sit in church pews all across the country today who when they hear a sermon preached, think to themselves, that sermon is for somebody else in this room at this point in time. 
but it's not for me. Here's a scary warning. You can listen with great benefit to years of faithful preaching about Jesus, but it will not do your soul any eternal good if you do not trust and obey him. You can listen for years, but apart from trusting Christ, judgment is coming. The second truth about Jesus that we see in the text, not only does he come along and he is the son of David and Lord, I want you to see that Jesus desires authentic followers and judges rightly. Let's move on in the text in verse 38 through 40 at what it says. The scene shifts then. And in his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at feast. And so the scene then shifts and Jesus goes from talking to the religious leaders to giving an intense warning about the religious leaders. The word beware in verse 38 means to watch out for or be on guard against. Listen, Jesus is not saying to watch out for political leaders. Jesus is not saying to watch out for the culture at large. Jesus is saying, watch out for those who claim godliness and who are deceiving you. That's the warning. Here, Jesus spoke truth to power and he gives us a great, great warning. And what does he warn us against? First, Jesus warns of mere outward appearance. He says, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces. The word like there is not really strong enough language, I don't believe. The religious leaders took great delight in wearing their robes and being recognized by the people who were around them. They longed to be recognized. Kent Hughes says they were power dressers par excellence. The scribes had these long flowing robes, full length shawls with with tassels on the four corners. These enormous blankets draped over them. And it signified they were distinguished teachers and scholars, men of great wealth and great prominence. The scribes were more interested here in recognition than they were in recognizing the needs of others. They wanted people to see them rather than looking to how they could serve the people around them. They desired admiration, not servanthood. The problem is not with the robes that they wore, but the fact that it was not common dress in their day. Listen, I grew up in the church south. Ah, if you hear me being critical of the church south, I want you to know I can do that because I am one, okay? I didn't come in from from New York, and now I'm being critical of all the culture. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an insider telling you what's wrong with the church south at times. I heard statements my whole life growing up. You need to wear a suit and tie on Sundays. You've got to give God your best. You've got to give God your best. Anything less than that is sinful. I, listen, I, and listen, I'm still kind of like this. Every once in a while, if my kids have got a ball game on a Sunday afternoon and somebody's swinging by to pick them up and they'll come in and they'll have their hats on. And I'm like, oh, it, just, it, it makes me uneasy to just look over and see Keller wearing a hat in a sanctuary. It just does. I don't know why it does. It's not sinful. There's nothing sinful. If you're a dude and you wear a hat here next week, there's nothing sinful about that at all. But I look around because I was, this is ingrained in me, right? Look a certain way, be a certain way. I went to Wyatt. I went on staff at Wyatt. They had just gone to two services. And when Wyatt was going to two services, Scott Rogers took out an ad in the paper. You know what he called the first service at Wyatt? The no tie service, no ties allowed. And it seems kind of cheesy, right? He says, hey, just come as you are, no ties allowed. And on the first Sunday, a man walked to the doors named Jocko Robinson. And they'd been trying to share the gospel with Jocko for years and years as Scott served in that community. And Jocko walked in the doors and he had on his cowboy boots and his jeans and a a button-up shirt. And he said, you got me. And a few months after that, Jesus got him. And he saved him. Listen, I want you to know this. Wear to church whatever you feel comfortable in. 
as long as it's modest, wear it. I'm not asking you to come dressed up with suit and ties. If you want to wear a suit and tie, by all means, walk in here with a suit and tie. I'm not going to judge you. Wear what you want to wear. I saw at Wyatt an entire church culture shift as people just, I mean, in Wyatt, what do men wear to work every day? Most of them wore T-shirt and jeans. You know what I saw walking around sanctuary every Sunday morning for about six years? T-shirt and jeans, because that's what men wore. Warren Wearsby said this. He said, if a person is important only because of the uniform he wears, the title he bears, or the office he holds, then his importance is artificial. Jesus warns against outward appearance. Jesus also warns against inward desire for attention. Go back to the text. Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces. They also like these greetings. They were not genuine men who desired to talk to the people around them. They wanted to have conversations with the people around them so that they could hear about how great that they were. These were religious snobs who wanted people to stand in their presence and greet them with their titles, rabbi this, master this, father so-and-so. I see this in the church today. There is an unhealthy desire for attention and admiration. And let me tell you what I'm learning the longer I live and I see these famous celebrity pastors. What I learned is no pastor was ever meant to be a celebrity. They fall consistently. Why? They were never meant to be what they become. One day we're all going to get to heaven and we're going to see some men who served faithfully and nobody knew their names. They served in remote places and rural places and they served and preached the gospel. They saw people say they shepherded families well and they're going to be the heroes of the church. We have men with PhDs who want people to call them doctor in church life. Among my generation, there's an unhealthy desire for people to be called pastor so-and-so. Jesus calls this religious pride that we should be leery of. Let me tell you what I love being called when I walk in the door. You ready for this? John Allen. And if you know me well, that's even condensed down to, to jam. I'm okay with that. Listen, these people desire to be greeted and viewed as if they were somebody. They were the religious experts of the day and they wanted the attention that came from that. And I would encourage everybody in the room to be leery of people that want attention. And be careful that your desire for words of affirmation that did not come from a place of validation because our validation comes from the person of Jesus, not from a position or from recognition. Also, Jesus warns of our desire for position here. Go back to verse 39. He says, and they have the best seats in the synagogue in the places of honor at feast. The best seats in the synagogue were reserved for people of rank because it gave them the best position to address the congregation. These religious leaders demanded that people pay attention to their rank and position of authority. No back rows for the religious elite in Jesus' day. Nope, they got a seat on the platform right there. Even special banquets. They insisted on being near the, near the head of the party, the host, because they wanted and desired position and prominence. The religious, the religious leaders spent their entire lives then exalting themselves rather than the God of the Bible. And Jesus is warning us to guard against that. Listen, there's nothing wrong with good seats. You're going to a sporting event, get the best seats you can get. But this is never about seats for these people. This is about position and power. And then Jesus warns against abuse of power. Let's look back in verse 30 at what else he lays at their feet, what other accusation he lays at them. He says, Who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They devour widows' houses. Understand something. Widows and orphans here were the most vulnerable people of Jesus' day. God blessed those who cared for them. He punished those who mistreated them. Most widows, which we'll read about next week, which by the way, Jesus takes one of the poorest, most vulnerable people in all the Bible to teach us a lesson on generosity. We'll see that next week. I probably shouldn't have told you that. That means we're talking about giving next week. If numbers go down, I'll know why. 
But most widows were extremely poor. But some weren't. Jesus said the scribes devoured widows' houses. He didn't tell us how they devoured their houses. But the point that Jesus is making is that they did it. They seemed to be righteous men, and yet their ethics changed when money was involved. Listen, I've seen money change people over the years. I say that. I forget who said money doesn't change people. Money just shows you who you really are. But I've seen money, even in ministry, become a dangerous thing. Again, celebrity pastors, conference preachers. What is, how much money does it take to bring in a guy to come and preach a conference for you? Listen, Brother Tom McLaughlin, years ago, my BSU director in Northwest, told me, he said, listen, don't ever set an amount that you have to get paid in order to go preach somewhere. I said, why? He said, because God's always going to take care of you. Listen, I have been to places and preached and not got paid a dollar to preach. I have been to places and preached, and what I gave them, I did not deserve the compensation they gave me in return. God always balances that out. I've never had to worry about that. But I've seen people prostitute the gospel for personal gain while their souls, or while souls of men and women are at stake. Listen, money doesn't change people. It just reveals more of who we are. And I want you to notice the contradiction in their lives here because in one sentence, Jesus accuses them of devouring widows' houses and in the very same sentence, he talks about their long prayers. Listen, their moral corruption was evident when they prayed these long prayers after taking advantage of the poor. We read this and think, well, how could they devour widows' houses and then go off in the temple and have these long, elaborate, eloquent prayers? Let's be careful. Let's be careful of how we look at them. Because there are times when we go to God in prayer, when we go into the Word, when we do things in spite of the fact that our lives are not reflecting what we're praying. Jason Meyer wrote this. He said, The length of their prayers does not demonstrate the depth of their devotion to God, but the lengths they will go in order to be noticed as religious. Listen, their public prayers were eloquent, and yet Jesus judged them as empty. Better a few mumbling words from a humble heart than a long, eloquent prayer from a proud heart. And then we notice that Jesus gives all these warnings. And then he gives those warnings because Jesus judges us based on our knowledge. Let's look at the end of the text one last time. What does he say about them? He says, they will receive the greater condemnation. This is eschatological, I'm not going to be able to say it catalogical language that points to final judgment. This is eschatology language. End times language. Final judgment language. Jesus says, you may get by for a time. You may be able to put on a show for a lifetime, but rest assured, you won't get away for eternity. Church, this is a great comfort for all of those who see oppression in the world, who see the needy and those in power doing nothing to help. This is a great comfort in knowing that one day God is going to judge the world in righteousness. Listen, at the end of the day, Jesus has the last word. He does. Even when they kill him by hanging him on a cross, he has the last word three days later by rising from the dead. You see, the one who does not know or live the truth about Christ is condemned. But those who are made aware of what the Scriptures teach and who fail to live out its truths will face greater condemnation. One of the mysteries of eternity is that heaven, or that in heaven, there will be no sense of loss, but some will receive a greater reward than others. And everyone in hell will be eternally punished. But Jesus himself says that some will have greater condemnation than others. This is a warning. 
And the warning that Jesus gives us here is not issued to prostitutes, tax collectors, and other notorious sinners. It is a warning issued to the religious hypocrites who were coming to church and playing church. And the final word of Jesus' public ministry is a warning to them to stop playing church before it's too late. You know what you read about in the book of Acts? You read about thousands of Jews coming to faith in Christ. You read about hundreds of teachers and rabbis coming to faith in Christ. If you want the bad news today, here's the bad news. The bad news is that there is greater condemnation for those who do not trust Christ after hearing the gospel. But the good news today is that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. So if you're here this morning and you've never repented of sin and trusted in Jesus, the invitation is for you to come and to escape the condemnation that is awaiting you. Because there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. And so in closing, I've got three points of application. Number one, I want to encourage you as believers to immerse yourself in the scriptures because they are divinely inspired. Let's remind ourselves that God wrote a book and he gave it to the church. Let's immerse ourselves in the scriptures. Let's read it consistently. Let's hear from God consistently. Number two, submit yourself to Jesus as Lord because he's God. I'm not telling you this morning to come and to find a life coach for yourself. No, I'm not telling you this morning to come and to go find a therapist, even though you and I both may need therapists. What I'm telling you this morning to do is to come to Jesus and to surrender to him as Lord of your life, because he's God. And number three, for those of us who attend church on the reg, guard against religious hypocrisy, and let's genuinely follow Jesus. Let's be on guard against religious hypocrisy, and let's genuinely follow Jesus. Church, Jesus has the last word. And the question for everyone in the room this morning is this. What is he going to say of you at judgment time? Will it be well done, my good and faithful servant? Or will we hear the words that everybody dreads to hear? Depart from me, for I never knew you. If you're an unbeliever, come to Jesus before it's too late. If you're a believer, let's treasure Christ. And let's live for Christ. I'm going to pray. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to the preaching of the word. Father, I love you and I thank you for the scriptures. God, I thank you that they are inerrant. I thank you that they are inspired. God, I thank you for how they work in our hearts. And I pray that you would use them at this time to mold and to shape the believers here in this room. God, I pray for the unbelievers. God, I pray that you would show them the realities of hell this morning. And I pray that they would see grace and mercy in Christ, and I pray that they would fall at his feet this morning. God, I pray that the gospel would go out with power and conviction, and God, that you would save those that are lost. God, move during this time. We love and ask these things in Jesus' name.